Right, good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to, warm-ish welcome to you here at Alverstoke uh, Evangelical Church. Good to see you all. Particularly good to see Jane Hodge with us. Um, you can all catch up with her um, a bit afterwards, and she's, well, she is around during the week, but check first. She's got things to do. So it's really good to have you with us, Jane, today, and uh, everyone else, whether you're a visitor or a regular. Um, a few notices. Um, to go through this week, I'll get Andy at the end of this to say a bit about toilets. Um, just to say that this week is growing together tomorrow morning. You'd be very welcome to that. Um, we have a members meeting this week on Wednesday. Um, at Thursday, is it? 17th. I was scribbling that down. So if you are a church member, do please prioritise that. If you can't make it, uh, please could you let Sue Titrington know? And if you're a proxy, or I have asked somebody to be a proxy person to vote, um, please will you sort that out before Thursday and let Sue know both who you're a proxy for and uh, who you are. Um, next Sunday is a dedication of uh, Naomi Brunt. So we look forward to that. So that will be a part of next Sunday's service. And I think that's it, really. Um, check whether your life group is meeting, because uh, some of us, when we have a church meeting, don't have a life group, so just check on that. And Andy, you were going to say something quickly about toilets. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Just to let you know, uh, just a couple of notices from the school. Toilets. Um, if you go out of that door, there are two toilets immediately on the, your right. They're not for us. Um, so please don't use them. I put signage there. Gentlemen, there's a disabled toilet around the corner. Ladies, there's a toilet down here, down this corridor. And if you need to get there in the middle of a sermon and don't want to walk down the front, the way to do that is to go out that door, then back through here and around down the library. So crash will be happening. Please don't come through where crash is happening. Please instead go down to the end of the library and all the way down this corridor and back to the toilet, um, just so you know where those are. Uh, and just a couple of other things. Uh, as I said in an email, uh, boys and girls, um, you're welcome to play outside in the playground at the back at the end. Please don't jump on the table tennis table, and uh, please don't try to break into a locker where there the school keeps their balls. You're welcome to bring balls and kick them around outside, uh, but please don't try and you know do that kind of stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have visions of losing half the congregation wandering around somewhere in there looking for the toilet later on. Hopefully not. Hopefully you'll be able to find that. So yeah, warm welcome to you. My name's Colin. And um, this morning we're looking at the continuing story of Elijah and looking at how he nosedived after the events of Mount Carmel, which we looked at next week. And so our first song this morning reminds us of our need of the Lord Jesus Christ and the need of our God. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. And certainly God, with Elijah, reached down into the pit of his despair and depression and lifted him up from it. And he's able to do the same thing for us. Let's stand to praise God. <laughs> Was lost, you came and rescued me. Reached down into the pits and lifted me. Oh Lord, such love! I was as far of you as I could be. You know all the things I've ever done, but Jesus' blood has cancelled everyone. Oh Lord, such grace to qualify me as. Oh, the 
right, do sit down. <laughs> I think about five of us had the words to that uh, second verse. Don't worry about that, though. Um, so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to look at um, something some of the young people saw yesterday about a lady called Nala, who came to know Christ when she was living in Somalia. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about that, um, but she speaks about what happened to her as a consequence of becoming a believer in Jesus in a country which is about 16 million people um, and where, from our guesses, there are only hundreds of Christians. So let's come to God in prayer briefly this morning. Our God and our Father, we thank you that many of us in this room can speak about being lost and you coming and rescuing us. Each one of us who knows that you have done that for us, Lord, each of us has a story that we uh, praise you for, for circumstances that brought about um, our sense of need and also the enlightenment of your Holy Spirit to see that your Son was the one we needed to get us out of our mess and for us to be made new in the power of your very own spirit. Lord, we ask this morning as we meet together that we would remember all that you've done for us. We'd remember too that life is not easy and that there are many difficulties, sorrows, pressures, conflicts that happen in our lives. And we want to thank you, Lord, that you've brought us into your family and you look after us that we thank you we can call you Father and that your eyes are upon us just as our minds and eyes are upon children and grandchildren as we think about what they're doing during the week. Lord, we thank you that in a far greater way you're watching over everything that's happening with us and you have time for us and we have access to you. Help us, Lord, this morning to hear you speaking to us, drawing near to us, comforting those uh, of us who are uh, upset or distraught, um, lifting up our eyes from wallowing in the things that are wrong in our circumstances, lifting them up to see you more clearly. May that happen, Lord, we ask. Um, give us grace and show mercy to us, for we need your work in each one of our lives. Amen. Yeah, so we're going to look now at Nala. Now, young people, some of you have watched this yesterday, so you should be able to remember it all. What I want you to do while you're watching it is not only listen to what the lady has to say, um, but also just to see if there's any words that she uses to describe her experience that stand out for you. Because I've picked this partly because it links in some ways with what Elijah went through in, um, as recorded in 1 Kings 19. So hopefully it will run smoothly, and uh, please do sit and watch and see what she My name is Nala Yasuf. I am 22. I am Somali. At home, I was taught to be a good Muslim. One day, I stumbled upon a YouTube channel of Somali followers of Jesus and started chatting to them online. At first, I thought they were deceived. But over time, we became friends. They told me about Jesus and urged me to read the Bible. I started in Genesis and kept going. So many of my questions were answered. For the first time ever, I felt peace in my heart. Eventually, I met other secret believers. That is when I was baptized. My family suspected nothing, or so I thought. In Nala's culture, to be Somali is to be Muslim, so she kept her new faith hidden. She knew that she would be in danger if her strict Muslim family found out. One night, my father called to say my mother was dying. I rushed home. But it was a lie. 
Someone had told him that I was not following Islam anymore. My brother beat me. He took my mobile phone and ID documents and locked me up in a room. They took me to a place where they tried to cure apostates and psychopaths and tried different rituals to fix what was wrong with me. After six days, things eased for Nala. But she was still watched very closely and sent for regular religious instruction. Seeing how hard things were for me, my sister advised me, pretend to be a Muslim, but pray to Jesus in your heart. And that is what I did. I would get up early for prayer, but speak to Jesus. It worked. My family believed that I was getting better. They decided to make it easier for me. But I was still so unhappy. My sister had a compassion on me again. She gave me my phone so that I could contact my friends and let them know what had happened. They were able to find me a safe place to flee to. But suddenly, before Nala could make her escape, her family gave her to a sheikh to be married. One day, before the wedding, my sister dropped me off at the mosque for my usual religious tutoring. I ran away. At first, I hid with friends. After one week, I fled the country with the help of my Christian friends. I arrived here with only the clothes on my back. I cried constantly. I was exhausted. I had constant headaches. It was all because of stress. My face was shaken. I asked God, why do you hate me? Have you forgotten me? God reminded me that it was he who helped me to escape. Thank the Lord for saving Nala and for providing the friends who helped her to reach safety. Please pray for God's comfort for Nala as she comes to terms with all that she has been through. Pray for those who offer spiritual support and discipleship to Nala and to new Somali believers like her. Pray that these new believers would grow to become firmly rooted in Christ. Pray for God's mighty protection over all who have come to faith. Pray that he will continue to build his church among the Somali people. Well, thank you guys for playing that for us. Were there any words that particularly stood out from the experience there of Nala? Or any things that happened? <laughs> I could answer my own questions, but I was... Well, one of the things that I noticed was her stress. I was stressed. She said she had constant headaches, didn't she? Um, um, she had to flee from her household, her family, uh, from her country, and find refuge in another place. And as we look at Elijah today, we'll find, and, and she said her faith was shaken. As we look at Elijah today and think of him as a human being similar to us in his feelings, we'll see too that his faith was shaken. We'll see too that he suffered as a consequence of what happened. And we'll see other aspects of his life that are enlightening for our own experience because none of us are immune to being hit by life's difficulties. I'll pray briefly before we sing. Father, thank you so much for rescuing Nala and delivering her from being indoctrinated and forced back into her old faith. Thank you that she came to see who you were and put her trust in you. Thank you for her appetite to read the scriptures. And thank you, Lord, for enabling her when she was lost to be drawn out of those difficulties and put in a safe place. May we learn to trust you through our difficulties too. Amen. So we're going to sing, and then after this, kids go out. We're going to sing, Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful and in the desert place. Let's stand to sing. <laughs> Blessed be your name, 
in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. If you're in Adventurers or J Squad or Tribe, your time to go out to your groups is now. Thanks for joining us as part of the service. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading now. Joe uh, is going to come and read that. Afterwards, Peter Davis is going to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you. Our Bible reading this week is uh, 1 Kings and chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal, me, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread, baked over hot coals, 
and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, the king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, the king of, over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mehola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand is Israel. Sorry, start again. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burnt the ploughing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Oh, a lot to think about in that reading, wasn't there? Let's pray together now. <coughs> Dear Lord, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. We thank you, Lord, in particular for being such a great Lord God, the almighty creator of the whole of the universe. 
when we look up at night into the stars and we see them, we realise it was created by you. And for that, Lord, we wonder and are amazed. When we look at this little planet around us, the earth, we see such wonderful things that you have created. What a wonderful God you are, and we thank you. But even though you have done so many mighty things, you still love and are concerned for us. So much so, Lord, that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, the Son of God, to us, to this earth. And we thank God for Jesus. And we thank you now that the scripture tells us that he is seated on the right hand of God in heaven. And because of that, Lord, we can say we are saved from our sins because Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth and became a man. And he died so that we might live. Thank you, Lord, so much for that. We thank you, Lord, that now we, like we're doing now, Lord, we have free access to that holy place in heaven and we can talk to you and you hear our prayers. Thank you, Lord, so much. We thank you, Lord, that as a group of Christians we can meet together as a church fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, that we can spur one another on as the scriptures also say spur one another on to love and good deeds and encourage one another and lord we thank you that that is what we can do because you are our savior help us lord as a church to be known as a group of christians who do indeed love one another who encourage one another and we thank you that we can do that. In particular, Lord, with that in view, we pray that you will bless us as we meet together for the church meeting this week. May this not just be a meeting of an organisation, but, Lord, may it be a time when we gather together thankfully and we praise you that we belong to you. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all those that we support as a church. We commit them to you. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all those in our own church who are suffering, who are finding life difficult, who are going through times of trouble. We pray that you will be with them. And I pray, Lord, lastly, that you, as we think of all the things, Lord, that you will help us to be a good witness to you and to others. Lord, as we meet other people in the week help us to be a good witness to you lord help us to love one another and show that love in the way in which we do this and we thank you lord that we can do this in this country we think lord of that um uh, dvd that we just saw and thank you lord that you have been so gracious to us so lord this morning we have so much to thank you for and this we gladly do you're a wonderful saviour and we are so privileged to belong to you. Amen. Well, we're going to thank you, Joe and uh, Peter, for leading us in the reading and prayer. We're going to sing God moves in a mysterious way and that in spite of that, we trust him, even though we don't see the full outworking of his plan very often in this life. Let's stand to sing.
passions or his bright designs and loves his sovereign that you know of water. Would that be all right? That would be a great help. <coughs> I don't know how much that song resonated with you. I, I felt that as we were singing it, perhaps various things were coming to our minds from our lives um, recently, perhaps, and in the past as well. Well, we're going to look um, this morning at Elijah. It's our fourth in the series. I've entitled um, this particular talk, A Man Like Us. Thank you very much, Joe. <clears throat> and um, we may not have felt that as we've gone through part of Elijah's life up to now because he's done some pretty incredible things. And yet we're told very clearly in the New Testament um, Elijah was a human being similar to us in feeling or was a person just like us. And that should alert us to something that is significant about Elijah. He is not some superhero. I mean, he ran from Carmel to Beersheba, but if you know superheroes, he's no Flash. 
Um, he was invisible for three and a half years, like the alter ego of the invisible woman in the Fantastic Four. And he was not impervious to harm like Superman. He was flesh and blood with emotions, capable of being overloaded mentally and physically, a person who was swayed by sin, capable of being afraid and capable of great courage as well. And I suggest, like us, he's rather a contradiction. He's a mixed bag. And when we think of our own lives, we are aware of that, I hope. I mean, for instance, with Elijah, he stands against 450 prophets of Baal and then runs from one woman, which is just bizarre, isn't it, from one standpoint. He lives obeying God's word by responding exactly to what God tells him. But in this passage, he um, flees from the presence of uh, um, Jezebel uh, without any command from God to do that. And he is a man of faith, but he's also governed by fear. As I said, he's rather a contradiction. He's a mixed bag. Paul recognised this reality about all of us who have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God who said, let shine, light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. We're fragile. We're capable of being broken, crushed, perplexed, in despair, persecuted, abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And we, therefore, are like Elijah. And we'll see something of his experience of life, and particularly after the events that we saw last week in, uh, at Mount Carmel. But also we saw, see too, that he's a man who depends on God in prayer. He recognises weakness. He recognises need of God. And in many ways foreshadows Jesus himself, who so depended on his father. And so we find in this passage um, that Elijah is under real pressure. There's the verse that I quoted from, by the way, in Corinthians. He's under real pressure. And you'll notice in the text that Elijah, as a consequence of this, in verse 3, was afraid and ran for his life. More literally, the NIV has a footnote. More literally, he saw and rose up and went for his life. Well, what did he see? He saw a very angry woman, Jezebel. She had committed herself to make sure that uh, the state's enemy number one, Elijah, would uh, be dealt with in the next 24 hours. And Elijah, who up to this point, has stood in front of hundreds of people who thought exact opposite of him, um, now wilts under the threats of this woman. He saw and he ran. Now, we experience in life that reality too, don't we? We see things very much with our eyes. So there's been times, haven't there, where we've gone to bed with problems that are unsorted and they fill our minds and as we try and sleep, we can't get any peace. We're, uh, what is dominating our perspective is what's going on in our lives. We have a looming problem that causes butterflies in our stomach. We have uh, an impossible situation that spirals our, our minds downwards into fear and despair. And this sort of thing is happening here to Elijah. He goes from great courage into great fear. And we see in this his fragility. And you've probably seen that as well. That annoying, irritating, energy-sapping problem that just won't seem to go away. Um, draining your energy and your mind. But he needn't have been like this. If we go uh, into the New Testament to hear what Moses was like, listen to this. By faith, he, Moses, left Egypt not fearing the king's anger, who was out to kill him, he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Notice Elijah saw the very visible Jezebel and that began to dominate his actions. But in contrast with Moses, who faced a similar threat to his life, 
he saw the God who is invisible, and that enabled him to persevere under the trials that he faced. Elijah, at this point, is only seeing the threat to his life, and the root out of fear uh, is to, for him, he sees, is to leg it down in towards the wilderness, um, but he's been overawed by the visible, and he was not seeing him who is vis- invisible. And that is something we need to work at as people, isn't it? When we find our minds being consumed by problems at our sleepless nights, we need to recognize uh, work at taking our eyes off our problems and our sight of what seems so real and tangible and oppressive and put them on the God who is, when he's with us, as he's promised when we put our trust in Christ, is greater than him who is against us. Now notice in verses 3 to 5 where he's fled, there is no word of God here telling him to go to Beersheba. Beersheba is about 90 miles away, which uh, implies to me he was quite a fit guy. Uh, If you go onto Google and put Elijah the prophet, um, he's always sort of really old and his um, great achievement seems to have been to grow a massive beard. Um, but you notice here in the text that Elijah legs it all of this distance. So I assume he's a young man, but, you know, we'll ask him one day when we meet him, if you're a believer in Christ. Um, but it's interesting, he flees, he hides under a bush tree and he, uh, or a broom bush, and he fell asleep. No word of God to do this. He seems to be acting off his own back, and you'll notice he's in despair. Verse 4 I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. In fleeing like this, he reminded me of Jonah, who also found shelter, this time on a hill, not in the uh, place where Elijah found it, uh, who also spoke to God and asked, Lord, take away my life. Um, God had also given him shelter from a plant, And uh, we're finding here that Elijah is going through a similar experience. And you'll notice, perhaps, if you compare and want to compare Elijah and Jonah, they both had an incredible experience of dealing with uh, people and perhaps seeing them turn to the living God. But both of them came to an end of themselves. And Elijah here in verse 4 has had enough. Does that sound familiar to you? Oh, no, of course, none of you have had a, ever got to a point where you've had enough, have you? And never got to, there's never been a point in your marriage, if you are married, where, oh, my goodness, can I put up with him or maybe her and, uh, anymore? There, there may well have been tensions like that. You're not going to share them with me now, but you know for yourselves whether you've had them or not. You've probably had that feeling, haven't, haven't you, in a job, in relationships, or even in a church. I have had enough. I want to get out of this. And I've experienced that myself in the past. And it's worth noticing that there are others in the Bible who have got to the end of their tether and have cursed the day that they were born. Job said words similar to that. Jeremiah definitely said words to that. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, a child is born to you, a son. Cursed be him, he says. And we find Moses himself saying, when he's experiencing the burden and the difficulties of all of the people, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Please go ahead and kill me. I wonder if you've ever got to the end of your tether like that. I mean, sometimes it's not much fun reading of other people who've got to the end of the tether. But if you've got to the end of your tether, how encouraging it is to know that that is not just unique to you. That others of God's servants have felt that as well. And have come through that and persevered. And actually, in all those people I've quoted you, Elijah, Jonah, Moses, Jeremiah, and Job, it's interesting that all of them ask God to take their lives. They don't decide to take it themselves. They recognize that their life is not even for them, 
uh, a life that they are allowed to take themselves. And they ask the Lord to take their lives. And Elijah asks the Lord to take his life here. It, you can see how low he's got. He is, to be honest, sick and tired, I suppose, of what he's been through and how he feels. And that leads me, um, I'm, I haven't, he's gone run out of fear. He's lost sight of God. He's got the visible very much in his eyes. He's had enough and he's drained. Um, you'll notice he sleeps um, at the end of this. Do you remember Jonah when he ran away from what God had called him to do? Um, what did he do on board the ship? Slept, yeah. Got first class accommodation, a nice comfy bed. Um, puffed up the pillows, you know, guaranteed to give you a good night's sleep. He lay down and he slept. Interestingly for me, years ago, I heard a man pre preaching on Jonah, and he says, when you run away from God, it's extremely exhausting to try and go the opposite way to the way that God has called you will wear you out. And he said, that's probably why Jonah was asleep because he was knackered from his experience and because he was going in a completely opposite direction to the one that God wanted him to go in. And Elijah's doing the same thing, and he's drained. Now, perhaps we can trace something of this in Jonah, uh, Elijah's life um, because he had started off really well talking to Ahab about the fact it wouldn't rain. By the way, you can draw your own graph here. This is not biblical. This is just my, my take on it. And then he disappeared. This isn't a, a, a spiritual downer. This is just the fact that he disappeared for a period of time and God supplied his needs. And then we find him at Mount Carmel. I'm not sure which is the greater peak, the fire from heaven or the rain that came. So I've stuck them two up there, and you can decide for yourself which was the greater experience for those who received it. But then he face plants here, literally. And this is after he's run all the way from Mark Cowan. Well, I expect he walked some of it, because 90 miles, I feel Martin might have been able to do that once. The rest of us couldn't, but he'd gone all of this distance, and at the end of it, he's exhausted. He wants to give up. He's in the biggest pit ever. He's drained. Um, he's experienced great things, but it sapped his energy. He's exhausted. Now, is it surprising? I mean, I, I can't compare, and probably you can't compare, with anything that Elijah experienced on Mount Carmel. I have been, I have taken assemblies where there's 300 odd students, and I've been doing that, perhaps not very well. Um, you do have the feeling. How many of them are Christians? 300 kids, maybe 10, 15, and the rest of them don't want to hear a word that you've got to say. That takes some energy to get up in front of them. I mean, it's a bit like being a teacher, isn't it, when you only got 30 and they don't want to listen to you. You know, that's energy sapping, isn't it, because you've got to try and instill in them some enthusiasm for what you're doing. But anyway, um, he, has, he is exhausted from fleeing God. And bear in mind, he's not only been in physically opposed by great odds, but also spiritually opposed. He's been in the midst of a conflict for the hearts of these people, so that they will not um, waver between two opinions, as it were, that they'll actually put their trust in God. And uh, yes, he is drained. And I suggest, too, that uh, and we'll, um, upwards, and upwards and onwards next week, I suggest, too, that he is spiritually depressed. He is disappointed. I think the jury is out on Israel having turned wholesale to God. I know they said the Lord is God, the Lord is God. You know, and people say that sort of thing when they see something spectacular, but it doesn't necessarily mean their hearts are changed. Uh, and what it's led for Elijah is not to be embraced as, oh, great prophet, you've brought us back to the living God. Instead, the consequence has been the death threat on him. I think the ju jury is still out, and maybe Elijah is disappointed at the consequences that all has gone on. He thought he was perhaps greater than his ancestors. In verse 4, take my life, I am no better than my ancestors. Maybe he thought he was going to be better than his ancestors, but no, he's wilted, he's disappointed with 
the results of his ministry, he's disappointed perhaps with himself as well. He's also isolated. He's on his own. He leaves his servant behind at one stage and departs along. And, and he'll say to God, he says it twice, um, and you'll find that uh, down in verse 10 and I think in verse 14, I am the only one left. Now, uh, one man has said, this is evidence perhaps for him being depressed, Depression isn't only caused by the absence of community, so it isn't only caused by being on your own, that actually being on your own also perpetuates depression. And so he's isolated on his own, and he's distorting reality. I am the only one left. Well, not all of us are good at maths, but... If I'm not mistaken, he, he knows that there's 101 other believers, one being the Obadiah and 100 hidden in caves, that have not bowed their knees to God. He's not on his own, but you'll notice in this pit of despair and depression, he's not seeing that. He actually has an overinflated view of himself. He thinks he's the only one who's following the Lord. God will later say to him, well, add to the 101, 7,000. There's 7,101 plus you. You're not on your own. Get your maths, or go back to school and listen next time when they tell you how to add up. Um, but you'll notice this is becoming all about him. Um, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, verse 10, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Now, we don't know that the Israelites are trying to kill him at all. Jezebel is, but not the Israelites. He says, I am the only one left. Well, selective memory, eh, isn't it? You know, like he's forgotten 101 other people in that calculation. He thinks it's all about himself. And he sees himself as this poor little man who's opposed by everybody else. And you'll notice in this... Uh, this comparison that he's doing, because he's rubbishing them, isn't he? And making himself out to be the only zealous one there is. You know, that's probably a, another aspect of what's going on in his heart and mind. And sometimes when you go down, one of the ways of making yourself feel better is to look at the faults in everybody else. And if you can rubbish everybody else, then you feel somewhat better yourself because you're taking your eyes off your disappointment, your isolation, your difficulties in your head or in your body. And, and uh, there is this self-importance that has crept in, which we call pride, to Elijah that he states this, I'm the only one left. I've been very zealous. They're all against you, God, but not me. I've stuck with you. And there's this horrid self-importance that rises up. And of course, we know that, don't we, sometimes? We sometimes like to compare ourselves with somebody much worse than ourselves, and therefore we think we're somewhat better. And, you know, when sometimes when we say to people, well, we're all sinners, um, people say, well, I've never murdered anybody. You know, I'm not one of those people right down there. You know, I'm not that bad. And it just helps us to use illustrations like that to feel a bit more comfortable with ourselves. I wonder, I am digressing here because he left his servant behind and he travelled an extra day without him. But I think if Elijah's servant had been with Elijah when he's into this pit of despair, the servant might have looked skyward to think, I know God sent fire down once, but the way Elijah's behaving now, as if he's the only one, the only saviour of all of Israel, I'm going to wonder if it, God's going to send fire down a second time to consume him, because he's way above himself, he's not looking at me, he's not considering all that I've done, he thinks he's a lone one and nothing can happen without him. How puffed up he has become in this moment. There are causes for this. And there were struggles within him, but he needed, like we do, to humble himself before God. And in all of this uh, situation, um, self-importance, God acts. He lay down under the bush, fell asleep, and all at once the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And there was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again, and he was fed a second time. Here is this 
great servant of God who has been governed by fear, who's fled from the mission that God had given him, acting on his own initiative and not from a word of God. And God, in response to that, does not tell him off, rebuke him or cajole him. He brings him food. <coughs> food to refresh him, food to, re, to invigorate him, food to strengthen him, food to get him back up on his feet, food to restore him to what God wants him to do. Isn't that kind of the Lord? Very practical, very gentle, very purposeful. God really knew what he needed at that time. And we must look out for how God helps us when we're down, when we're low. We must watch it that we sleep. We must watch it that we continue to eat. But most of all, we must watch it to see how we can turn our eyes upwards and how we can see in the little things of life God's great purposes. Um, I, I was interested, uh, I, I had a phone call to make to somebody to ask for some advice and um, after talking for a little while with that person, I realised he was an Obadiah. He was the head of the organisation that I was contacting, but I discovered that he was a believer. I discovered that he's part of a church. I discovered that he felt for what I was asking him about. He had compassion. And afterwards, the next day, he sent me a personal email to say he'd shared it with a few friends, and they'd been praying for me, and they'd had an image, and he conveyed what that image was. And I thought, how remarkable of the Lord. When I needed help, not only did I go to somebody who, who actually could address some of those issues, but he turned out to be a Christian. Isn't that marvellous how the Lord, in the midst of our difficulties, can prepare or has prepared already people of significance? And so after this, uh, Elijah goes on to the desert um, and uh, the revelation that he has on Mount Horeb, which was the place where Moses received the law, is uh, this strange combination of her horrendous wind um, of a huge earthquake, a fire, and then came a gentle whisper. Let not the Egyptians be afraid and quiet yet. Let us be still and hear that the Lord is in the area. Did you hear that, any of you? Some of you did. If you're going to speak in a gentle whisper, you need to be up really close to somebody for them to hear. And all the mighty things that were going on around him, out of that came God himself, who spoke right into Elijah's ear. What are you doing here, Elijah? You notice he repeats what he said earlier. And then as a consequence of this conversation, this God who stoops down and speaks in his ear and, and um, asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Challenging him. Uh, for the second time, really, about where he's got himself. Um, we notice the Lord then gives him a new vision. The Lord, in verse 15, said to him, um, verse 13, the voice said, and that's the Lord speaking to Elijah the first time since he's gone through this um, face plant, and he calls him to go and anoint these various people. But in all of this, what we see amongst all the other things that we've mentioned. So he gets given bread, God speaks and reveals himself to him. What we see here is that God works to save him. Because he's got lost perspective. He's lost the vision of what God has called him to. He's become proud. He has uh, got into this horrible business of comparing himself with others and seeing himself on top. And God has come and spoken to him. And sometimes, well, we always need that, don't we? Get over yourself, Elijah. Stop pitying yourself, Elijah. I, there are others. I've reserved 7,000. I am doing something that you just can't see. You've, you've got this very, um, and in depression, you know, you can get quite inward and isolated and thinking very narrowly. And God expands his view and says, look, you've, you aren't seeing what I'm doing. Look, there are people, even in Somalia, who I am reaching through YouTube, 
Some of you don't even know what YouTube is, but she knew it and the Lord knew it. And the Lord is reaching out to people like that and saving them. You know, it's not just you on your own. The God is doing a work here. He is keeping a people for himself. Never think, you know, oh, we're this poor little church. You know, I don't know if we think that, but we're, you know, there's only 60 of us who meet these days, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean to say that this is the only work that God is doing. There are other places he's at work. And uh, we must trust him for that, of keeping people true to himself. And so we must come to some application to it. I've tried to apply some of it. But um, Elijah's words are picked up by Paul in Romans 11 to say that um, (coughs) when Elijah said, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, the Lord's answer to him was, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So we could probably go to any country in the world and find, even in the the harshest circumstances, that the Lord has his people there. And we're not alone. And the whisper in his ear said that God was with him. We need to... uh, Uh, That's just that quote. We don't need to look at it. Seeing the invisible God. Uh, I haven't done this yet, but, you know, there's usually, if you say, what are the benefits you've received from the Lord? We'll list certain things, you know. Certain things will pop out. But the thing is, uh, as we go through scriptures, there's loads of things that people have benefited from the Lord. And we need to go over those in our minds and in our thoughts and set our eyes on them that we must maybe sustain through the difficulties. Um, So do not forget all his benefits. And remember, we are fragile, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Even God the Son took on the fragility of being human, that he might experience the tests and trials that we experience, that he might be exhausted, run down. I mean, he slept on the boat, didn't he? Because he had worked so hard teaching and power had gone out from him in healing others. He too was fragile. He too could be hurt. He too had been amongst us to uh, display the glory of God. But unlike us, he didn't need a saviour because he was the saviour. He can save us from ourselves and from our sin and from our pride and from our distorted reality. Um, And we could say a lot more about that, but I'm not going to. And eventually we'll see that this Elijah, and though he is flawed like us, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's him there with Moses and Jesus. Somebody asked me the good question, Peter, uh, how did they know it was Elijah? Well, now you know the answer, not because of his big bushy beard, but because he was fit and agile and he could run 90 miles, you know, with, on superfood. Yeah, so that's how they knew, whereas perhaps Moses was bushy beard. Anyway, anyway I'm, I'm digressing. But we need someone from outside. We need a saviour. We need the Lord. And uh, this man with all the, the gifts and the courage that God gave him at different times in his life, he came to realise that He needed that still, small voice. He needed the sustaining power of his Father in heaven. He needed him to get him up, someone from outside him. We do too. I don't know where you are. Do you feel like giving up? Have you had enough? We have days like that. We have moments like that, don't we? Where you've thrown the meal in the bin because it's all going wrong. Uh, You've had experiences like that. Well, others have too. And one of the marvellous things with which I finish is that Elijah, during all of this, he had learnt to pray. He even learnt to pray when he wanted God to take his life, which seems a bizarre prayer, but it shows how low he was. And God lifted him up and got him through. For God brings down the proud but lifts up the humble. And when we get to the end of Elijah's life, he's lifted up in a quite unique way. Uh, God, in his goodness, did that. Well, let's come to God in song and say that we face a task unfinished. 
Uh, we may not see God bringing down fire from heaven, but we can direct our requests upwards and we can kneel before him that he might work amongst us for his glory. Let's stand to sing. Do sit down. Um, I'll pray, and then you're welcome to uh, come and join us for refreshments. Let's 
speak to God. Father, um, I was, as you know, I was interested that Jesus met his disciples after his death and resurrection on the beach with a fire of hot coals and with fish and with bread. And it was almost like after the trauma that they had been through, you met with them to re-energize them, re-envision them, and to give them strength for the work ahead. We ask this week, Lord, that there might be places in our lives this week where we sense that, as it were, we've sat with you and spoken with you and been refreshed <coughs> and re-energized to be the people and the person that you want us to be. And when that happens, Lord, may we recognize your voice and willingly follow you in what you say. Amen.